what are the biggest challenges that you have encountered in balancing these long-term uh, vision, but also long-term incentive with the short-term incentives that are so necessary to uh, bring the project forward and to, to uh, make it successful on the ground so that communities and other groups adopt it? So the conflicts between short-term and long-term Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's it, it, it the whole what you describe is sort of the whole game of, of a bit of, of restoration and working with these rural communities because we can have these nice dreams of, you know, reforestation and, and a bigger vision of saving the planet and the climate, but to be honest, I mean they care, but these rural communities they don't really care. I mean that's that's the fundamental truth. They care about next year's harvests. They care if their animals can feed themselves and if they'll they'll have an income at the end of the day. And so I think the whole game is to make sure that you actually accommodate those things and at the same time try to guide them and get them on, on the on a long term path. Um and that's that's the whole challenge of the project. So yeah. Yeah, I think I mean I fully agree. I was just gonna say there's a couple of examples that I found stunning from um I was recently in the field. Um, being explained about the project. There were two things that completely struck me in Senegal particularly. Number one, it was absolutely about the livestock. Nobody, I mean, yes, the trees bring rain, I was told, but unless the livestock have grass, what, what, what point is there? And in the degraded ecosystems here, there used to be 15 species of grass. There are now only five, sometimes less, as many as two. And it's the quality of the grass that actually restoring land can provide instant benefits. So that's one of the, as foresters, <laughs> as foresters, that's one of the things that we've got to completely change our view on how you think about value in the short term. Um, and the other thing that, you know, don't forget about the long term, because of course, I mean, the people downstairs who I don't think are in this room are thinking about returns and what's happening in the future with carbon. But there is also the return on the, crash crops, so one of the, uh, the tree crops, one of the things we're trying to do is graft, learn new techniques to make the fruiting happen faster. But even then, you know, you talk about fruiting happening in five years instead of 10 years, it's still five years too late. So absolutely the short term incentives have got to win out. Yeah, yeah, just re really want to echo what Jill and uh, Jessica have said, really, the, yeah, the, the, it's really a privilege to kind of think long term is, uh, and I've just noticed that the, the communities, they can't afford to, right? To, like, like I mentioned in the presentation, it's, it's really a, a, a challenge because they, yeah, they have all these uh, kind of life things that they have to immediately deal with. And, and, and you know, it's like if, if a tree is going to fruit in five years, again, it's, like, it's, like five, it's five years too late. So w what we've had to do is... Um, you know, we're, we're using sort of agricultural residues to like make a oyster mushrooms so that they can get like more more immediate income or doing, you know, assisting them with say cassava processing. So again, just to kind of bring some um, added value earlier on while the, while, while the, while the trees are, um, uh, are developing. So yeah, it's, it's a really difficult balance. It's it's really interesting that we it, it seems like we all make the same experiences on the ground, and uh, just an example uh, in the mango season in Sierra Leone, up to eighty percent of the mangoes simply rot because of after harvest losses. So it's for for me it was the most important thing to understand where the short term uh, like like hardships come from, and. We, we were talking about uh, solar dryers for the mangoes. And I talked to the farmers, okay, what, what if you could dry the mangoes, which would, which would create jobs in the villages, and then sell them instead of May, which is the high season for mango, is to sell them dried in, in September. So they all begin to smile because they, they know, okay, you get, <laughs> you'll get a good price for that. And also what I've been talking about, the seeds, um, it's... They are, they are facing hardships also from, from, the, from the system down there. Be uh, at the beginning of the, of the um, groundnut season, they, um, 
they don't have money and they don't have products. So they go to the local seed traders and say, okay, give me a credit. And then it, they, they might lose the best moment for, for, for planting and then they uh, have to give back for 10 bags of groundnuts, they have to give back 20. So after five months, 100% of interest. So we gave um, to the community seeds, not as a, as a donor, but with a small amount of interest, so next year they will have their own seeds. And these small incentives, like on short term, and it, it, you can really generate commitment for the whole project uh, with relatively small investments, but a great help. So I want to I want to add something else as well. It's it's also structural as well. So it's like yeah, it's it's less kind of about like tree planting and all of these things. So we kind of can need to get these like structural road blockages out of the way of uh, farmers so they can thrive. And I think we all demonstrate like the farmers know what to do, but there's these like blockages that we need to uh, get out the way. Kind of like land tenure or if it's like infrastructure like storage for for example maize we're in a maize maize growing region so it's like like yeah. like, like you there's, there's so much post-harvest lo losses because they're just drying the maize on the side of the road right <laughs> and then if it rains like the <laughs> the the harvest is destroyed so there's a yeah there's like structural things we need to change to help to achieve that balance Maybe now we have some questions. Let's see. I think maybe everyone can hear you. Or give it a try. Or yeah. Okay. Yeah, Hi, um, I'm Wade from Global Forest Generation. And one thing I think that's not really being discussed all that much, even though it's really important, is actually like survival rates. And, you know, we've seen these like massive projects like in Turkey, a million trees planted in a day, and then you go back a few years later and, and none of them lived. And I just wanted to know, like, is this something you guys are finding that is becoming increasingly important when it's uh, reporting for like your, your investors and your donors? And how, do, how are you, you know, uh, addressing this when you decide to identify a restoration site? Is it a key factor to, to say that, okay, we think this is a good area that is going to have uh, long-term success uh, with the survival of, of what we're planting? Yeah, I think it's it's key. Uh, I mean, that's that's the stuff that I, I lie awake about at night. I mean, all this other stuff is also important, but yeah, I mean, the tree surviving is key, otherwise the project doesn't make any sense, right? So um, yeah, we see that, I think a couple of years ago, it, it was even, it was present then, but we now we see that the, the donors are asking more and more to, to keep reporting even in the long term, like not, not three years, but, but longer term. Um, and for example, we're developing a carbon project now, and there it's very simple. If you if your tree doesn't grow, then uh, <laughs> there's no there's no carbon credits. So um, so yeah, I think it's I think it's key. And for us, we 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 try to learn as much as possible from because we've been active for five years, and we know now which soil characteristics, which community characteristics, uh, site topographies work to do a successful planting project. And um, yeah, we, we, see, we still see in the Sahel, you need to take into account certain mortality rates. But yeah, we, we see that it's the, the, the survival rates are, are, you know, are also what keeps the project alive, so yeah. Just a, a great question and uh, something to add from, from our side. I think it's one of those things that makes me smile because oftentimes if people ask what's your survival rate, they also want to give you 15 cents a tree. And you're like, I'm sorry, if you're gonna do, if like, which one do you want? You know, you don't do cheap tree planting. It's a 15 year minimum commitment and you need to be paying at least two years capital investment in advance so that you can build the nursery so the seeds can stay and germinate for longer, so they're stronger. You have to do all of that, like millions of pit digging. You know, it's like it's a properly investing your time to do it. And so I think that's the other thing that, I mean, I'd be happy and when we can all, we all, I think, stand together and say, Cheap tree planting doesn't mean good survival rates. End of story. Yeah, yeah, and I think for, yeah, for, for us, I mean, we'll, the climatic zone we're in, I think there's like we've got like an abundance of of, of water. The soil is relatively fertile; it's, it, it's dropping dramatically. Um, but for for us, it's not really about the, the survival rate. It's it's more about what 
we're doing to empower the community for the kind of whole farming system to, to survive. Yeah, so I kind of like switch off if I'm asked about <laughs> like survival rates because then it leads to so yeah, 15 cents a, a tree and it's just not it's just not work it's just not workable, right? So um, yeah, we kind of need to change that kind of thinking and narrative about um, about survival rates and also also the the, the science is there also, right? Because if you Kind of again, like getting out the way and kind of letting nature do it what it does best. It rebounds so 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 fast. You ha can even have much better survival rates if you kind of just focus on the kind of whole um, system rather than kind of like the, in, the these individual trees. But yeah, I get it. They're they're about numbers, so it's it's difficult. <laughs> Yeah, so it's interesting. So we are we're in different regions. So uh, Kofi and I we are in regions where uh, there's abundance of water. So it's in the rainy season, so survival rates are not that difficult. I want to add um, that the trees should have sort of benefit uh, to the communities. And we visited like 20 years old uh, agroforest trees or maybe five years old who begin to bear fruits. And so people are interested if they get a benefit from it. And what we see that if you plant trees that people are familiar with, maybe not all of them, but the system, um, for example, mangoes, cashew nuts, uh, moringa is, is, is very common in the region. So this will help to, to engage the communities. And uh, second thing is, um, of course, we, we need people on the ground to, to help to develop the nurseries, to have the the, the really the best seeds to, to get strong seedlings. And if this works together with the community, so I'm, I completely agree with you, so it's, it's all about engaging the communities and giving them the benefits short term and long term. Thank you. Do we have a few more minutes? So if there are any more questions from the floor? Hi there, um, I'm Yi from uh, Terraformation. I'm curious, because we've, we've, we've heard so much about community engagement, short-term benefits, right, like economic uh, models. Like this is, this is tantamount to just like economic development, <laughs> right, developing new business models in a, in a, in a region. Um, and I'm curious, how much of that, like when you talk to your donors or, or, or grantors or your, your financial supporters, how, how much does that language come through um, and how much of a, a, a appeal <laughs> does that have uh, as a as a as a hook, right, for 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 financial support to talk about economic development, international development, as opposed to carbon per se? Yeah, I, I think it depends really on it depends from uh, it, let's say call it financer to donor to. We, I mean, we, we've been lucky with, I think, that Ecosia is also a forward-thinking partner because, we're, for example, we're not an NGO, we're a, we're a company, so we're, we're for profit, um, and that's also one of the selling points towards these communities, that we, we're for profit, so we're, I mean, uh, and, and, it, and it's going to be a win-win partnership. Uh, but it's true in some, in some other, let's call it e EU-based uh, applications, I don't know, it, you don't, you shouldn't talk too much about that, <laughs> but I mean that's just my experience. I don't know if you. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, similar, and and I would say it depends. I think, I think the one thing that I've seen happening more and more is that when you really need to talk about landscape restoration at scale, forest and landscape restoration, actually you move into a world that needs all of the donors with all their different drivers. So you need early stage risk investment and that's often from philanthropists who really care and it can be organizations who care about child and maternal health nutrition all of the things that they want to catalyze and then you can bring in the next layer of funding which might be corporate sponsorship because they care about trees and then you bring in your people who really don't want to take the risk carbon finances perhaps once you've moved to so i think we're moving into a world of what is commonly called blended finance but i think in order to do that you need to get everything to work at the same time you get everyone on board you know and that's a super super challenging but i think that's really the only i think that's probably the best way it's like the ultimate model is get everyone to finance bits of it that they care about but um yeah 
Yeah, we have really good question. Got me, got me, got me thinking. Yeah, that's it's a challenge that yeah, we we've had. It's like yeah, they're just not in terms of the, our initial main uh, funder. Yeah, just didn't get you know, and, we were, and so we were thinking it's like how, but that's you know, it's 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 really it's really two different ways of thinking. So it was really challenging to kind of balance that in terms of the 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 stage where at we're at. And yeah, it really is about kind of understanding what type of finance you're going for and sort of being mindful of avoiding certain types where you know and, and in terms of the stage where, where you're at yeah nice yeah really good got, got me thinking yeah it's a great question and so my experience is that, that our first investors um, they did not really care about the numbers so they they just of we we invited them for investment, not for for donations. Um, and most of the time we were talking about how are you sure that you will really generate impact? How you are really sure how to that the, the local communities benefit from it? And so, of course, the economics of the business should be in place. Uh, we should do our homework for that. But in communication at this early stage where we are, um, my experience is that impact communication is far more important uh, than like have all the digits uh, in, in, in place for, for, the, for the return on investment.